Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. So nice to have all of you here. I invite you as we call ourselves and our hearts and minds into God's presence for worship to please stand. And our choir will minister to us in song as God's Spirit leads us into worship.
Please join me in the call to worship. Let us come before the throne of God and join all creation in worship. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You are worthy to take this role and to open his seals. Because you were slain and with your blood, you purchased saints for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy.
Would you please greet one another as you're seated this morning? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship this morning. Um, you are at the First Congregational Church of Holden. I hope that's where you're meant to be this morning. Do you realize occasionally we do have people come and they're like, oh my gosh, they screwed up. I'm supposed to be at the Baptist Church for a baptism. But I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, I'm glad you chose to worship the Lord. You know, it's never wasted time to set time aside each week to gather together with God's saints uh, to worship Him wherever you may be. Welcome this morning, those of you who are visiting with us. Always nice to have guests. And um, if you happen to be on that journey looking for a church to call home, uh, we would love to explore that with you. Um, feel free to let someone know that you'd like to know more about the church. You can also take advantage of that uh, blue card that says connect in front of you. Uh, fill it out and we will do our best to get back in touch with you. No pressure, no hard sell. Uh, we don't sell your contact information, but we'd love to get to know you, uh, share with you a little bit more about our church. I invite you all to turn to this purple Lenten colored insert uh, as we journey through Lent and um, our announcements are illustrating that. A um, couple of things, you'll notice uh, the handbells, I think we're pretty well on the way there. Um, so, but if, if it's never too late, perhaps, uh, if you'd like to be a part of our handbell now or later, you can see Meryl Havens. Um, she's running, coordinating that for us. Thank you, Meryl. Worcester Work Camp, we are excited to have our kids, our senior high youth group, getting ready for another work camp local this year in Worcester. We don't have to go very far around the world to find need um, and opportunities to serve. Um, coming up is going to be a cookie drive. Um, I don't think we're ready for an announcement or details this morning, are we? But next week, uh, and we're excited about that, and we'll give you more information about that. Women's Fellowship uh, has regrouped and is excited to offer and announce uh, they'll be meeting a week from Sunday night during youth group time, um, which may work out well for some of you. Uh, at 6.30 in the lounge, uh, uh, we will have our Women's Fellowship. Um, I'm not invited. If you can't figure that out, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, anyways, but come, uh, women, and be a part of that. Now, speaking of Lent and Easter, our Lent soup suppers are well underway. We've got two left. Never too late to come. We're having great conversation. I, I hope many of you, even if you're not coming, are able to read through the Adam Hamilton's book, 24 Hours That Changed the World. It's a wonderful, insightful book. I'm really enjoying it. I think those who are reading it are getting a lot out of it as well. Um, there are a copy or two downstairs, I think, left. If not, there's one or two floating around my office. Uh, but grab it, you can get it on your e-reader. Come on out, uh, whether you read it or not, and join us if you'd like for the next couple of weeks uh, for a soup supper with our Baptist neighbors. Holy Week coming up at the end of March and beginning April. Palm Sunday will be a big Sunday here with the palm waving and processional. It will dip us into Holy Week as we begin to focus on the seriousness of Jesus uh, suffering on the cross. <clears throat> Monday, Thursday will be April 2nd. Uh, we will have a kids program that night, so if you want to come up with your younger kids, it'll be just an hour. Please note this, Monday, Thursday will be communion for April. We will not have communion on Palm Sunday, and we will not have communion on Easter. Though I'm always tempted to do that. It's a little difficult logistically and with all the kids and everything. So Monday, Thursday will be our communion service. Um, come on out to that. Good Friday, of course, uh, is a wonderful service. And if you can make that, we begin at the Holden Gazebo and we process with a cross with our brothers and sisters from around town and worship here and at the Baptist Church and over to St. Fred. Wonderful service. If you've never been, I encourage you to come. And then Easter Sunday, uh, working on it this morning with our confirmation class. Our um, confirmation class will once again be running our sunrise service. Come on out to that service. There'll be a, a small light breakfast following it. Um, and then, of course, Easter Sunday, uh, we'll be here in full regalia. As I always tell everyone, come early for those really good back row seats. 
Um, if you come late, you'll end up down front. I get to look at you, though. Easter lilies are on sale and tulips downstairs. Um, Joanne and Carol, our flower girls, um, are taking orders for those. Um, is today the last Sunday? We're getting pretty close, right? Two more? This, this Sunday and next Sunday. Um, sign up to dedicate flowers or tulips in memories of loved ones. There's an insert that goes in the bulletin for that. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to have Terry Peterson from our leadership council come up and share with us um, a good word. Is there anything else I needed to announce that I forgot? Terry? So Terry is one of the eight members of our leadership council, and um, they're working hard in this restructuring process, and he wants to speak to you a little bit about that. Good morning. Um, the reason, as John said, the reason I'm here today is to uh, first and forth, 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 forth most, um thank you, the congregation, both here and at home, for all your work and energy in thinking and, re and redoing our ministry organization. Um, as you may be familiar, we've circulated this uh, schematic over. This is what we're working towards, and thank you for the energy and ideas. Um, it's been truly inspiring um, to hear the, the passion and, uh, on that. Um, the second reason why I'm here to, today is to let you know and give you a status update of where we are. How do we get from what we have now to what we hope to have in June? Um, and let me first say that um, the change is effective in June. Apparently there was a rumor going around that the meeting that we had in January abolished all existing committees. That's not true. Um, you, know, you're, you still do the work of the church if you're on Spreco or you're on CE um, do your, uh, doing your monthly meetings. Um, so how do we get there? Um, the first thing is each one of the leadership council members was asked to go to the existing committees and ask those committee members who would be willing to serve on the successor committees. And from that discussion, we create a list. Um, the second thing we did is we consolidated all these time and talent surveys that many of you filled out. We put that in a database that's actually on our church website, and from there we have a, um, a second list. Then we met with the nominating committee. We did a special meeting, and we gave them both lists. And we charged them with looking at both the, list, the first list of existing committee members willing to serve and the second list from the time and talent survey. And that's where the fun begins. Um, our nominating committee, and I don't know if they're here, is, is Fred Connor here? Is Alan Shaw? Uh, is Duncan here? Okay, well, they're really good people. Uh, <laughs> and um, they, their pictures are on the church website, so feel free to, to look at them. Um, um, yeah, they have started meeting. They may have already started to reach out to you um, and get some, you know, some, some feedback if you're interested in serving on a, a committee, which we're going to be calling teams going forward, um, and talking to you. Um, their job is to, uh, to propose a new and final list of, uh, of members willing to serve in the new ministry, ministry teams effective June. Um, being that there are only three of them, the Leadership Council will be meeting with them uh, regularly to help them out in that process, and we'll create a new roster. Um, from that, uh, that new roster will be proposed to the congregation for approval at the May meeting, the very end of May, and um, once that's approved, uh, you know, we will start with a new ministry uh, structure. So if you have any questions or concerns, um, more ideas, please feel free to reach out to me or any membership of the Leadership Council or the nominating committee or Reverend John. And uh, I'll, we work for you, we're excited, and, uh, you know, and we'll make the time. Don't feel like you're imposing on us. So uh, thank you very much for your time. God bless. Thank you, Terry. I do hope uh, you will prayerfully discern uh, your part one of the beauties of a congregational church is we get to run everything. One of the challenges of a congregational church is we have to run everything. Uh, we need your help and uh, your involvement. Uh, it's a sacrifice and a commitment, uh, but hopefully a joy if you get in the right place. So take to heart what Terry said, and as that nominating committee calls you, uh, consider how you might be a part of our ministry. By the way, committees, that's so last year now. You're invited to be a part of ministry and a ministry team. So I hope you will consider that. 
So kids, let me ask you a question. Do you know why God sent Jesus? You're going to learn that today in Sunday school. And I hope on the way home from church, you can tell your parents. And parents, I want you to ask your kids in the cart. So, why did God send Jesus? Kids, you may now go to Sunday school. And parents and teachers, uh, we appreciate you bringing your kids. And we appreciate all that you do. Have fun in Sunday school, too. So Terry Peterson's class is doing something with fire in the fireplace in the lounge. So I said, if the fire alarm goes off during my sermon, you'll never hear the end of it. So I, today we're going to, at this point, we'll turn our attention to prayer. And I invite you to turn to the back of your purple insert. And at the same time, I invite you to open your hymn books. We're going to do something different for a response this week. What number is that? So if you want to put on your lap him, uh, response 632, which is the Lord's Prayer sung. So we always end our prayer with the Lord's Prayer, and it was suggested that we try uh, once in a while, uh, rather than saying the Lord's Prayer, prayer followed by a response from the choir, let's sing the Lord's Prayer um, from the hymnal. So when the prayer is over, we will go right into singing, and you're all welcome uh, to be a part of that. So note the joys and concerns on the back of your bulletin. Uh, people this week, we want to keep in our prayers Jane Neal. Jane Neal has come home from the hospital. Uh, she is at home now, but in hospice care. Uh, we're not sure. We don't know how much time Jane has is with everyone. Um, we don't know, but she is in hospice care now. Keep Jane in your prayers. Jim Beardsley, uh, still at the Jewish Rehab Center. Uh, keep Jim in your prayers. Dick Johnson, uh, who is seeking wisdom to get his throwing arm back, um, a shoulder surgery. Um, uh, Leah Keevan, um, who's been in critical condition with a staph infection. Is she doing any better, Jim? Or? Still, in the Still in the hospital, so we'll keep Leah in our prayers. Um, Jen Robbins, who just, Jen, who's recovering from a broke, injured foot, who just hobbled out of here. I know she wants me to stop saying that, but I can't help it. Um, ask for prayers, uh, coping with uh, her parents. Uh, her parents are aging, and uh, her mom, as you know, is recovering from a serious accident last fall. Uh, Bernie, uh, who is the Wickman's neighbor, and I also discovered through the prayer notes, uh, very good friends with the Landry's, um, recovering from a fall and an infection. And Sam Sundin, uh, who injured his elbow and apparently is in a cast, I guess. Uh, he's not here this morning, but keep Sam in your prayers. Uh, also prayers for Bill Watson, uh, who is uh, Gail Thompson's uh, brother. He's been in the hospital with an infection. He has been put on the He's in ICU. He's in ICU right now. Okay. Uh, he is in ICU on a ventilator. Um, the prognosis is not good, but let's continue to pray for Bill and for Gail. Other joys and concerns this morning. I have a minimum quorum of three, or I'm not allowed to pray. Is that a hand, Rachel, or just you sure? It could be God's will. Dorothy. Yes, Stephen. Thank you for passing that on. So last week we prayed for Steve Van Fekman, um, who was having some melanoma removed from his face, and they got it all, and it's cancer-free. And uh, he said, be sure to thank you all for praying for him. Tell him he's welcome anytime. 
Other joys or concerns this morning? Daniel, yes. Let's praise God because I'm proud of the hospital. I'm proud of the rehab. And after the surgery, it took me only seven days to walk without a walk. Amen. So Daniel had knee replacement, as you may remember. We prayed for him. He's in rehab, and seven days later, he says, I'm able to walk stairs and better than before. So praise God. Anybody else? You are quiet. That's okay. It gives me more time to preach. Let's um, come before God in prayer. And don't forget to uh, keep the hymnal open for the response of the Lord's Prayer at the end. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you for the gift of prayer. We take it so for granted that we can simply call out to the creator of the universe, the almighty God, master of everything, and you hear us. There are so many people that we couldn't get to listen to us no matter how hard we try or have a conversation with or get an audience with. And yet you listen to us when we pray. Lord, thank you for this gift. And help us to take advantage of it because you encourage us to do so. May we be a people of prayer, not just when we gather on Sundays, but everywhere we go. And Lord, thank you for this special time of prayer that we have together weekly. Where we can share our joys and our concerns. Where we can petition you together for those needs that we have. Lord, thank you. We know that all of this is possible because of your son, Jesus Christ, and the gate that he has opened up, for he is the good shepherd and the gate for the sheep, and we enter into your presence through him. Oh Lord, this morning, as we gather in this place, hear the prayers of your people. We pray for those who have been mentioned, for Jane, and pray that you would give her peace in her soul and her body and her mind as she is in hospice care at home. Be with Jim as he recovers from his leg amputation and uh, seeks to move forward. Give him peace and healing. Give Dick wisdom uh, and open doors and lead the way for him to get his shoulder attended to. Uh, we pray for Bruce, Kelly's uncle, who passed away and be with all who mourn his passing. We pray for Leah and the critical condition that she's in with infection. We pray for healing and to bring her <clears throat> back to full health. We pray for Jen's parents and for all uh, who are trying to help their aging parents and all the various issues that go with that. Uh, give Jen wisdom and compassion and great patience and bless your parents as they seek to adjust to this stage of life. Be with Bernie as he recovers from his fall. Be with Sam as um, he recovers from his injury as well. Lord, we pray for Bill and uh, as he is in the ICU on a ventilator and the prognosis doesn't look good. Lord, we pray that your will would be done. And of course, we would love to have him with us a little longer. We lift him before you. We thank you for Stephen and the successful surgery that he had. And um, <clears throat> thank you for answering his prayers and our prayers. And Lord, we rejoice with Daniel and the successful knee replacement that he has and the quick recovery and literally back on his feet. Oh Lord, hear these prayers that we lift before you this morning. And hear now these prayers that we add to that in this moment of silent prayer. Oh Lord, hear the prayers of your people. For those who are sick, we would ask for healing. For those who have lost their way, we would ask you to light the path and put their feet on it. For those who are depressed, lift them up and renew their joy and give them hope. For those who are lost in the darkness of the spiritual world, show them your Son who came to light the way 
and bring them to salvation and to faith in you. For those who need help with their daily bread, provide for their needs, Lord. Provide jobs, provide better jobs, provide ways to pay the bills and make our way and even to have enough to give to good causes and to those in need. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray not only for ourselves as individuals and our friends and family, but for ourselves collectively. Be with our women's fellowship as they uh, regroup and, and try a new program on next Sunday. Be with our youth as they prepare for their Worcester work camp this year. Be with our nominating committee um, and with all of us as we try to find our place uh, in the full ministry here of First Congregational Church. And today we pray for our brothers and sisters at Holden Chapel, for Pastor Curtis over there, and ask, Lord, that you would give them the same blessings we ask for ourselves. May they grow in their knowledge and wisdom of you and their fruitfulness of ministry and outreach to others. We thank you for Holden Christian Academy and for Susan Hayward, their principal, and ask that you would bless them. And Lord, we pray for Worcester Fellowship and our opportunity to reach out to them even today after church. And bless all those who will be participating in this ministry to the homeless. And thank you that the weather seems to be holding out and not as bad as we thought that uh, perhaps we can minister to as many as possible today. Thank you for all the opportunities you give us and the greater church to serve those in need and to spread the gospel of Christ. In our community, we pray for our senior citizens today, for aging parents as we had before. We thank you for our senior center and for all the services uh, available to senior citizens. Uh, Lord, bless that venture, and uh, may it be fruitful, and may it truly meet the needs and not frustrate the needs of those that it seeks to help. And Lord, be with us as a community of faith and other churches that we too may see how we may minister and reach out to our senior citizens. And in our wider world, uh, we pray for our negotiations uh, regarding nuclear weapons with Iran and all the interesting complications that seems to be surrounding that. We continue to pray for the racial tension in our United States, thinking of Ferguson, Missouri, and all the police unrest and the incident at the University of Oklahoma uh, with the fraternity this week. And even in our own local area, Lord, we know that we are not innocent of uh, racial tensions and racial discrimination. None of us are. So Lord, help us as we heal, as we seek to see the value in all people created in your image. And Lord, finally, we pray for climate change and ask you to give us wisdom uh, to separate the hype from the realities to take care of this wonderful world that you've given us that we may pass it on to future generations until that day you come again and make everything new. Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
The first reading is from John chapter 3, verse 1 to 21, found on page 1650 in your pew Bible. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. You know what, Tim? That's the wrong reading. John That's chapter 3? Pardon our technical difficulty. Oh, John 3. The pages got flipped. By the way, you may have noticed this is not Lauren Line. Tim's filling in last minute for Lauren right there. Nicodemus, remember. Right. 3, 1 to 21. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the sign you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born with, when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and do not, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. So the Son of Man must be lifted up, if everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world from through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned, already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people of darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever, whoever lives by the true, by the true comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Thank you, Tim. Sorry about the confusion. Let's, we're going to stay in the Gospel of John. If you want to flip over a couple of pages, I'm just going to observe some of the further adventures of this Pharisee Nicodemus. John 7, 45 to 52. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why did you not bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob who knows nothing of the law, they are under a curse. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet 
does not come out of Galilee. And then flipping over to John 19, these little places that Nicodemus pops up right after Jesus has breathed his last on the cross. John 19, 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with, many spice, with the many spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial custom. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Here ends our readings from the Gospel of the Lord. May God the Holy Spirit give us wisdom and insight. By the way, I'm going to do the same. You might want to open, keep your Bibles open to John 3. At some point, I want to walk us through part of that passage. Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites. That was last week. In our Encounters with Jesus series, we focused on the Pharisees and Jewish leaders who didn't have a great encounter with Jesus, who actually couldn't stand him, who were filled of jealousy and envy and thought he was ruining everything rather than making everything better. And of course, Jesus clashed right back with them. Woe to you, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs. I mean, ouch, ouch, and ouch. So I suppose after last week and figuring out who these Pharisees are, we've got a good label for them. Nobody likes the Pharisees. There can't possibly be anyone that's good. Ah, but leave it to God to form a mold and then break it for us, which is what God is always doing. Good lesson right here as we begin. Because we're about to meet a Pharisee named Nicodemus who moved from the dark side to the light. Right from the start, let's beware of those overarching labels. Because God loves to mess things up. I remember one time a, a local minister said, there's no life anywhere in any mainline church. Woe to you mainline churches. And I said, au contraire. I said, let's meet and let's talk and I'm not saying we're all that great or any of us are all that great. And he probably shouldn't have thought he was all that great either. But let's talk. There's life everywhere. And you may label us. Some of you have felt this. Some of you said to me, I go to a congregational church. And some of my conservative friends are like, why do you go to a congregational church? Nobody preaches the gospel at the congregational church. But they do. And you can't go with these sweeping labels. You've got to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. In my experience, God has people everywhere. Everywhere. Even in places where on one level I would say, don't go to that church. Don't believe what they believe because I believe their message is distorted. And in some ways so distorted, I think you might get really led astray. Even in those kind of places, God has his people. And it's often easy to despair and think you're the only one if you're in a situation like that. I hope you don't feel that about your church here. Um, but even if you do, you're never alone. Reminds me of Elijah after he had had a great moment of calling down fire from heaven and burning up all the uh, sacrifices that he had given the Lord, plus Baal, plus a few hundred of Baal's prophets. And then he flees and says, I'm the only one left. And God says, no, you're not. 
There's 7,000 people left in the city who have not bowed their knee. I have people everywhere. So as we begin our encounter this morning of Jesus with the Pharisee Nicodemus, let's beware of those sweeping labels because here's one that breaks the mold. I mean, Jesus himself said, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites, don't listen to them. And yet, even in their midst, there were those who were on God's side. So, last week we talked about the Pharisees, the religious leaders. So, there were basically these two groups. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were both Jews. They had differing opinions. It might be today the difference between saying, well, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Congregationalist, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Protestant. And if you step way back, you're like, yeah, but you're all Christians and I don't even know what you're fighting about. We'd say, no, what we believe is important and it distinguishes us from them. So we're not the same. So the Pharisees and Sadducees are kind of like that. They're different sects within Judaism. And out of that group is a group known as the council. Hey, kind of like our church, right? We're a church of a few hundred. We've got eight people who are on the council. They were a group of several, many thousand Jews, and there were 71 who were part of what was known as the Sanhedrin, or the ruling council. So Nicodemus is of the Pharisee sect. I mean, picture Baptist, congregation. He's a Baptist, it's a Pharisee. <laughs> That's bad. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> he's a Baptist. He's a Pharisee. No. Uh, the Sadducees, by the way, were kind of the aristocrats. They were the wealthy group. And the Pharisees were a little more everybody's kind of group. So there's about 6,000 Pharisees in those days. And a handful of them were on the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council. So you could say, picture Democrats and Republicans. And while there's hundreds of thousands of Democrats and Republicans, there's only a handful that sit in the Senate and work things out. So there's a handful here that sit in the Sanhedrin governing the affairs of the Jewish people. Now, as we get into Jesus' trial, we're going to discover they don't really have any power. They can't put someone to death. They have to go to the Romans who have all the power. But they have certain power over their own people and certainly over their religious uh, rites and festivals at the temple. So Nicodemus is a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. And he comes to Jesus... At night. Now turn in John chapter 3 with me and let's walk through his encounter. And for those who are visiting or, or haven't been with us for a while, we're trying to see all these different encounters Jesus had with people and what we can learn. So now, verse 1 there was a Pharisee whose name was Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. Now that's significant. He didn't want to make a public statement, and we'll see this later. He came secretly. Didn't want to hold a press conference in our day and age or a big scene. He said, let's just off the grid, off the record, let's have a conversation. Nicodemus is not cold. He's not closed. He's a seeker. And we see that later when he says, well, shouldn't we hear what this man has to say before we jump to conclusions? We saw that later on as Jesus is being tried. But right now he wants to go to Jesus and says, I've got a few questions. So verse 2, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Interesting, he says we. So there must have been a few others in his little circle or party there of people that said, you know what, we're not so convinced this guy's of Satan and of the devil. We think there might be something here. We know that you're of God because... No one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Now this, in Jesus' day, this was a big thing. The miracles that Jesus did, the blind who could see, the lame who could walk, the dead who were raised. This was evidence that he was God's son. Probably not as much in our day and age because we're so used to Hollywood. I don't know what God would have to do. Like, oh, that's just trickery. That's magic, whatever you're doing. Maybe God would do something else in our day and age. But that was his proof and their proof that he was who he said he was. We know that you're with him. So Jesus responds, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That's like a Belichick answer, by the way. Sorry. What? That's like a Belichick answer. I was watching the, the Super Bowl highlights last night and... Uh, um, he doesn't answer the question. He just moves on to something else. We're not talking about that game. We're talking about the next game. We're on to this game. We're on to that game. So 
Nicodemus asks him this question and Jesus just goes on to another subject. I tell you, just throws it out there. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So we're going to have a conversation here between Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus isn't seeking healing. He's not seeking reconciliation. He's not coming humbly and repentant, seeking forgiveness for his sins. He hasn't been accused. He's an intellectual seeker, not like a lot of us. And he has some questions. So this is an intellectual conversation. Jesus throws it right out. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Now let's just stop right there. The word born again has some baggage in our culture, so just let that go. We all need to be baptized, but we're not all Baptists. We all should be part of a congregation, but we're not all Congregationalists. We all should embrace the Catholic, yeah, Catholicness of the entire church, but we're not all Catholic. So these are groups that have taken on a name of something we all should be. So you don't have to be a born again to be born again. But everyone, and this is what Jesus is going to say, and I hope you hear this if you don't understand it already, everyone needs to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. There's no other way. So Jesus says, I tell you the truth, I'm in verse 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Nicodemus, good Bible study question, how can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. Now, that's a crazy thought. Don't think too much about that, but imagine trying to do that. It's insane. So Nicodemus says, well, that's silly, Jesus. I don't understand. I, in fact, I don't even know how he didn't get the spiritual meaning here, but he didn't. No, you can't crawl in and crawl out again. So Jesus clarifies. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Now, some people along church history have made water to be baptism and of the Spirit, but in this case, it doesn't mean that. Jesus clarifies it in the next verse, 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Right, ladies, when you give birth, one of the first things that happens is what? Your water breaks, and you give birth to a baby, born of water out of the womb of your mother, and born a second time of the Spirit. Interesting point implied right here. No one is born full of the Holy Spirit. No one is born that way. You're born of the flesh. You need to experience a rebirth through the Spirit. That's important. And perhaps that was the gift or the emphasis of the whole born-again movement of the 60s and 70s to remind us that you don't just automatically get filled with the Holy Spirit. We are born into sin, into a sinful world. That's that whole idea of original sin. And we need to come out of that default position of sin and away from God into relationship with God, into salvation to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, verse 6, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound and you cannot tell where it is coming, where it comes from. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Interesting point I read somewhere in my study of this this week. You really had no control over your physical birth. It just happened when it happened. Perhaps your parents did, but you certainly didn't. You were just born when you were born. You had no say. It just happened. When you're born of the Spirit, it's kind of the same way. We try to program. This is one thing I often wrestle with. We try to program in our kids, well, you're going to go through this and this and this, and then at this age, you'll be baptized or you'll be confirmed and you'll be born of the Spirit. But it doesn't work that way. The Spirit blows where it pleases and it leads people to Christ and brings people to life in God's own time. For some it happens when they're really young. For some it might happen in the teenage years, 20s, 30s, 40s. Some people it happens right before they die. Some, unfortunately, it never happens. But the Spirit blows where it pleases. And just as you had no control over your natural birth, so it is God who chooses the timing even though there's a partnership there between you and him in your spiritual birth. How can this be? Nicodemus asks. To which Jesus retorts. Here's maybe a little baggage of the Pharisee thing there. Now that's interesting, Nicodemus. You're Israel's teacher. And do you do not understand these things? By the way, this is Jesus' biggest beef with the teachers. He's not really trying to do something new. He's trying to get them back to the basics of what it's all about. 
back to my Belichick example, gentlemen, this is a football. This is the basics. The Pharisees had gotten into all this stuff and they'd missed the point. And I think this is Jesus here and his beef off nights. I'm, I'm amazed, Nicodemus, that you don't know what I'm talking about. You've lost the spiritual realities of what a relationship with God is all about and you're all caught up in all these rituals. Verse 11, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as a Son of Man just, uh, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. So Jesus is saying no one's ever entered into this place. No one's been worthy, except for Jesus, who came down. And it's God's will that everyone who looks to Jesus will be saved. Interesting, you know the story, in fact, it just happened to be in my Bible reading this week. Um, Moses lifting the snake. There was a plague of snakes in the Old Testament. And when God delivered the people from the snakes, he had them put a snake on a pole and Moses lifted it up. It always reminds me of the, the symbol for healing and medicine. Though they say it has a pagan root, I'm like, boy, oh boy. The fact that the people look to the snake and the pole for healing and that our symbol for medicine has a snake on a pole... I don't know, that's what works for me. I'm not sure the pagan meaning, but I see that Moses meaning all the time. And Jesus was to be crucified to a pole, and all who would look to him would be healed, just like in that day, all who looked to the snake on the pole, which is kind of a weird thing, would be healed. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then Jesus goes on to say this wonderful thing to Nicodemus about God loving us, God sending the Son, that all who believed in Him would not be condemned because it's our sin that condemns us and leads to death, but would be healed, would be forgiven and washed in His blood and cleansed and set free. And if we just look to Him and look upon Jesus and believe in Him, we would be saved and we would experience the new birth. <clears throat> Does it make sense to you that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again? Sometimes I think our Pentecostal friends confuse us on this matter sometimes as well by overemphasizing the spirit and making, and of course you can't really overemphasize it, but perhaps saying you need to have some sort of emotional experience or um, you need to have some sort of charismatic experience or speaking in tongues or, or falling down or something. And then we say, well, that's not me, so I'm not a Holy Spirit Christian. Don't fall into that category. The Spirit manifests itself in all kinds of ways. In some, it's exuberant. It's waving your hands. Right, Meryl? And uh, praising the Lord like that. In others, it's quiet and it's subtle, but it's the same Spirit. And there's no such thing as a Christian without the Holy Spirit. So don't fall into that line of thinking. But you don't have to wear the born again label, you don't have to wear the Pentecostal label, the Congregational, the Baptist, or the Catholic label. But everyone must be born again of the Spirit. And I wonder if you're wondering, am I born again of the Spirit? What do I have to do? I come here to worship, I give in the plate, I think I believe. I certainly haven't rejected Christ. Have I been born again? Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ receives the Holy Spirit. Now some seem to walk more powerfully in the Spirit and others not so much. But the Spirit is there. And my encouragement to you is to ask God to fan into flame that spirit in you. Say, Lord, I want to experience your power. I want to experience whatever it is you have for me. Don't be afraid of where God might lead you. 
I always tell people, there was a while that I loved to be exuberant and, and wave my hands and be a Pentecostal. When the, when the Holy Spirit comes on me, and it does in powerful ways, I get incredibly still. And I sense the power of God in an incredible way. And I want that. And I want you to experience that too in the way God has for you. I think every one of you, and I challenge you, should experience the power of God in your life in a way that is real. In a way that's more than we just sang a good song and I feel nice, or I feel the love of other people, in a way that you say, you know what? I know that is God and His presence and His power. I just know it. And it's okay if you're sitting here thinking, I don't think, Pastor, I've ever had an experience like that. God wants you to have an experience like that in your own way. Not my experience, not Merrill's experience, since I picked on Merrill. Not anyone else's experience, but your own experience in a way that you say, that is undeniably God and His power poured out on my life. So that you can have confidence that you've been born again. That the, because you've looked to Christ on the pole and believed in Him, that you now have received rebirth in Christ. Grow into that birth. When you were born the first time, you had a little work to do. You couldn't go to the bathroom. You could, but not properly. You couldn't eat. You couldn't walk. You were so helpless. But you grew and you learned. And eventually you became who you are today. When you're born of the Spirit, it's the same thing. You've got to learn to eat. You've got to learn to walk and talk and fan into flame that reality. But as Jesus said to Nicodemus, Everyone, everyone must be born again. Everyone must walk in the power of the Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't be afraid. The Spirit will change you, make you more like God wants you to be. Now, what happens to Nicodemus? So he kind of stays undercover. Some outlines of Nicodemus say that was his weakness. I'm not so sure. He goes back. So some are called like Peter, James, and John and they, they hear Jesus and they believe and they leave their business and they go off and they become disciples and follow Christ. But not everyone can do that. I often think when I say you should follow Christ with all your heart but not everyone could be a minister. Very practically, if everyone was a minister, who would do the other? Who would pay for the minister? I know that sounds very pragmatic, but I even think about that too. Everyone couldn't be a minister. Everyone can't be a priest or a nun or a monk or a missionary. But everyone can serve God with all their heart where they put Him. So don't be overly misled by those 12 who Jesus called to leave everything and follow Him, or by the other disciples who had greater responsibilities. Here's Nicodemus. Seems like he believed. He went back to his old job. He was one of those, woe are you, brood of vipers, hypocrites, whitewashed tomb, Pharisees. But God had put him right in the right place, I guess. And so there he is when Jesus is being judged and he is able to be a voice for justice. These people are so against Jesus. And he speaks out and says, hey, how about a little justice here? Let's have a trial. Let's hear the guy. Let's not just lynch him. By the way, they did have a trial, but it was such a mockery of a trial. It was almost like lynching. They didn't have an official trial. Nicodemus is speaking reason. And then notice at the very end, Jesus is on the pole. Jesus has given his life that all who look to him may have eternal life and live by the Spirit. He's now died and he needs to be laid in a tomb. And who is there? Joseph of Arimathea, <coughs> and Nicodemus. Now, I'm reading a little into this because we don't know, but I'm imagining they're friends. You know, people in similar social circles tend to socialize with each other. So, Joseph of Arimathea is a rich man, but he secretly believes in Jesus. Once again, one of those who, hi, ah, couldn't give up the riches, but he is a believer, so he's kind of undercover too. And Nicodemus, who hasn't like publicly come out, is sort of subtly fighting for Jesus behind the scenes. We see the two of them using their position. Joseph with his wealth, and Nicodemus with his position of power, they acquire Jesus' body. 
And they lay him, John doesn't say it, but the other gospels do, in a rich man's tomb. This was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Now think about this. We love the story of the stone being rolled away and Jesus coming out. Jesus was a poor man. That's not how you buried a poor man. A poor man got a poor man's burial. I mean, it's like over at the cemetery. You've got the gravestones and then you've got these vaults that rich people have. This is a vault. Now, if Joseph had given up his position of power and wealth... He wouldn't have been where God needed him to be to take Jesus' body from Pilate and lay it in the rich man's tomb and roll the stone away and seal it. Now, I'm not their judge. And Jesus elsewhere said, beware of riches. Beware of power. Leave everything and follow me. But the reality is, is Jesus has people all over the place. Nicodemus stayed where God had planted him and was able to serve and honor God there. Joseph of Arimathea had wealth and was able to use it for the glory of God with what I'm going to assume was his friend Nicodemus. So as we kind of wrap up this encounter with Nicodemus, and as I began by saying let's be careful not to label everyone in a particular group as one way and take it on a case-by-case -case basis, let's end with that. Let's also be careful not to assume where somebody has somebody else is not where God wants them to be. And let's not necessarily assume where God has you right now is not where God wants you to be. Bloom where you're planted. I love the old story of a Christian king who decided that in order to serve Christ, the best thing for him to do was to give up his throne and to go be a pauper. It didn't really work out well for him. And then finally, one of his advisors said, if God wanted you to be a pauper, he would have made you a pauper. But he made you a king. So now go and be the best king you can be for the glory of God and Jesus Christ. God scatters his people all over. And he puts them in all kinds of different places, socially, powerfully, wherever. All for his glory. Nicodemus, in very adverse situations, was able to find faith in Jesus Christ. And in the midst of that, was able to advocate for Jesus and even serve him. So was Joseph. That's my prayer for you. <coughs> Learn Nicodemus' lesson. Look to Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. Fan it into flame. And then wherever God has placed you, seek his wisdom. Be courageous and bring him glory. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for all these people who encountered you while you walked the face of the earth. Continue to help us to learn from them. Thank you for your servant Nicodemus, for the questions that he asked that led to such a wonderful unveiling of truth of how your spirit gives us rebirth. Lord, for those today who do not know you, who have not looked to you, who have not experienced that new birth, I pray that today would be the day. And for those of us who have already looked to you and have your spirit, Lord, fan it into flame. That there may be no doubt that that second birth has taken place. That we are loved by you and filled with your spirit. That we are empowered by you to be the men and women you want us to be. And then, Lord, give us wisdom as we journey this life in our second birth, in your kingdom. To be the people that you desire us to be. Show us where we live, where we work, where we go to school how we can be advocates for you, how we can quietly or loudly be your witnesses. To this end, we give ourselves and an even greater way for this end, you gave yourself, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have an obligation to proclaim the gospel. We are entrusted with a commission, so we give freely of our time and abilities where we are. And we send and support the witnesses of others where we cannot go. Let us continue to give generously.
us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your amazing gifts. And today we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit and the new birth that it brings. Lord, thank you for the gift of making wealth in our jobs and all that you've blessed us with here where we live. Receive now these, our offerings that we bring to you. They are first and foremost an expression of our gratefulness and thanksgiving for all that you've given us. And then, Lord, we ask that you would receive them and use them to strengthen the ministry of your church here to help those in need and spread the good news of Christ across the street and to the ends of the earth until you come again in all your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. makes me feel like spring bursting through the snow into life, doesn't it? And that is exactly what God wants to do in your life. He wants the Holy Spirit like flowers and grass and buds bursting up from the ground to burst forth out of you into joy and praise in all that you do. That's my prayer for you as you leave this morning. Go, find your way, fan into flame the spirit that is within you and rejoice and serve the Lord in all you do. Go in faith in Jesus Christ. Go be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go and bring Him glory in all you say and in all you do. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.